um, Mohamed Abdul Haq Anu. Um, so I'll just wait for other um, speakers um, to be seated. You know, some sessions are running late, so just give We have people already online, so please just give us um, some five minutes for us to get um, started. Um, thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon. As I said earlier on, we are here for this um, NRI session on how do we achieve universal access in the short term. We have um, NRI speakers from Bangladesh, from Bolivia, from Georgia, from Ghana, Kenya, and Tanzania. And um, we shall be looking at um, a, 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 a lot of things happening. On our online, we have um, um, Mr. Kosi Amisu from Bini IGF for his um, repertoire. And we also have Mr. Um, Jang El Haj um, from Internews um, also moderating. So, uh, with, without much ado, um, I think um, I will get, I will get um, started soon and I will allow um, my panel of um, NRIs um, to introduce themselves before we start. So, please um, introduce yourself, starting with you. Thank you very much, Wisdom. Um, and, and good afternoon, uh, everyone that is attending to the session. My name is Roberto Zambrana. I am from Bolivia. I am also a third year MAC member, and I am uh, related with the coordination of uh, our governance forum in the country. Um, I'm, all, I'm also involved with the academia and technical community. In, my country, and that's why uh, we are so interested in expressing our position regarding uh, well, what is internet, universal internet. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Mohammed Abdullah Onu from Bangladesh. I'm looking after Bangladesh internet governance process. I'm a Secretary General of Bangladesh Internet Governance Forum. And also, we are uh, organizing last uh, uh, 1917, we are organizing the School of Internet Governance. Last two years, we are organizing English Internet Governance Forum and also Youth IGF, Women IGF, Kids IGF. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, if I have um, colleagues from NRIs from Ghana, Tanzania, um, and um, Kenya online, please can you um, introduce yourself? Um, online Zoom moderator, please can you unmute them? Online moderator, please. Um, can you just mon monitor? Sorry, do you have 
my colleagues from Kenya, Ghana, and Tanzania NRI, are they online? Please, can you introduce yourself if you're online? Or if um, Barak is here, please, I can't see him anywhere. Get my phone. And Ghana is here. Okay, you are here. Yes, yes, I'm Wisdom Donko. Um, I'm the coordinator for Ghana IGF. So, please meet you, all of you. Um, where's Barack? Okay, I will get started. Um, achieving universal access in the short term is very important. Access has become a key problem, not only um, today, but it has mo it has much more been emphasized during the um, COVID-19 shutdown. And we all, we all know how a lot of communities in various um, parts of the world um, were not able to access various types of information, whether it relates to education, whether it relates to health, whether it relates um, to, uh, to daily life. Um, the NRIs, as you know, the National Regional Internet Governance Initiatives, um, are very key in promoting access and that is why we have various nri um, um, co um, country coordinators here um, for this session so i will want to start with um roboto what do you think in the short term you um, um you come from um south america what do you think in the short term can be done to achieve universal access working with all stakeholders over to you roboto thank you very much uh and I think it's not a question, it's the million question, not only for this session and not only for this IGF, but I think it's the question for all of the last IGF in attending to. Um, and uh, despite it was uh, included, I mean, this concept was included in the sustainable development goals. And as we all know, we already surpassed the first deadline that we had, that was a deadline. But at least the expectation that we have to achieve this. Uh, uh, universal access for 2020, we all know that we failed as humanity, to, particularly in the global south. So uh, I think it's really, really important not only to continue discussing about the subjects in all other parts for us, and, and including this one, of course. We, parenthesis, I have to say that it's a pity that we actually combine two macro themes in our current IGF chart. Uh, human rights, which is, of course, very, very important, and the um, universal and meaningful connectivity, because some, somehow it diminishes the importance of this particular subject. So, of course, there are other important subjects regarding human rights and, and uh, regarding some other aspects of the literacy, access, etc. But I will say that, uh, hopefully, for the fu future, um, version of the IGF, uh, we continue given this the high importance that we need to provide in order to actually achieve all the objectives that we have regarding this matter. Um, otherwise, it, it, we will be waiting again for the new, for the new expectation, which is established now for 2030. As we all know, this is already uh, a statement included in the roadmap for digital cooperation. I mean, from the Secretary General, and it's again the subject was put as the one as the different subject recommended in the in the um, agenda for the um, summit of the future, including in the digital compact. So that's why it's really, really. But that's what we want to achieve. Uh, it, a different thing is to actually do concrete actions as all the different stakeholders to achieve this this uh, this universal I mean access and now I will have to say particularly in, in in terms of my country what the good things have been done during the follow during the last three or four years uh, one of the major aspects that we were discussing in our in our local dialogues uh, is related to the business models in in particular in telecommunication sector in about internet service mobile internet services and the big problem is that uh for our countries again particularly in the global south it's really really difficult for our population to cope to 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 afford all the costs that uh mobile 
uh, represent, mobile internet service represent. And if we don't get the support from the telecommunication companies, if we don't get this kind of contribution for this sector, it's going to be really, really difficult. And we can wait for another two, five, ten years to actually reach to the to the poor population, to the rural sector that actually need. You mentioned the pandemic was a true example of what happened. Most of our population, besides the, we were listening about the statistics all the time. One third of the population, it's still to be connected. Yeah. But what really happens in our regions, it's not that kind of statistics. We, we are really lack of statistics. It tells us that we are below the 50% of people. And we realized about the situation when we had the pandemic. Most of the people um, in the rural areas couldn't make it to go to classes. Most of the people didn't have a chance to go to, to, to actually develop their work, their activities. You, to the lack of internet, and not because there weren't uh, uh, coverage for the telecommunication company. There is, there is coverage. The problem was the problem with the affordance to, to, to the affordability of the services. Well, but not everything is are, are bad news. Uh, when we started to discuss about business models back in 2017, 2018, um, and somehow we were looking like strange people when we propose that we need to change the, the current business models and we need to change something like very basic in, in, in internet services, not that we are, uh, remember that I'm talking about back 2018. We were or, already started to talk about 5G and uh, what I was saying always is what can we think about 5G if we didn't already um, uh, use it correctly 4G in, in, in mobile telecom telecommunications in mobile internet and uh, the problem was about the business models and we asked it to the sector that at least have a, a basic level of service that we could afford as as, as citizens uh, without the the traditional model of packages of information packages now the good thing is even if it's a little bit expensive but at least they released this kind of new kind of package which is a continuous package which is not uh, for a particular quota and you pay a fee and then you have a mobile services with the basic amount of of, of information that at least can be um not cut when the people are, are using it's just an example i would like to continue later but i just want to express that when there is a will there is a chance to the political aspects and the, the, in this example, the business. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Roboto, um, sharing your experiences from Bolivia and um, your perspective, especially with the issue of um, 5G, when we still have a lot of problem rolling out um, 4G in a lot of places in the global um, south. Moving over now to Mohammed from the Bangladesh NRI. Um, Bangladesh is well known to, um, as a country for manufacturing of clothes that are all over um, shops in Europe and all over the world. And um, one of the main things that happens there also is that your whole supply chain system really dep depends on connectivity. So, so I'll, I'll come back, how, how is rural connectivity in the, in the short term? What has been done with stakeholders, especially the government in Bangladesh, to ask to achieve it within the short term? Because um, 2030 is not far, and we have a lot of things going on. Over to you, Mohammed. Thank you, honourable moderator, honourable speaker, and honourable audience in room in around the world. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself from Southeast Asia country, Bangladesh. Bangladesh is population is 160 million. Connectivity is a multi-stakeholder process. Need to involve all stakeholder for assuring connectivity. We need to know exactly challenges, opportunity, progress, and way forward regarding these matters. In Bangladesh, we are organizing every year Bangladesh Internet Governance Forum, Kids Internet Governance Forum, Youth Internet Governance Forum, Women 
Internet Governance Forum and also Bangladesh School of Internet Governance. Through this forum, we are trying to accountable all multi-stakeholder regarding connectivity issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was um, very brief. I will hand over to my colleague now from Tanzania, NRI, um, NASA, to give his perspective of um, within the short term achieving universal access. NASA um, is responsible for the Tanzanian NRI. What's your NASA? Uh, thank you, Paul Slate, and uh, I apologize for being a little late. Uh, I was uh, at the African Open Forum for, for, the, for organized by the African Union. Um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Naza Nicholas Kirama, and I am currently the manager for Tanzania Digital Inclusion Program, and also um, I wear so many titles. Sometimes I forget. Um, also the president of the ISOC Tanzania chapter and uh, the NRI coordinator. Uh, well, the the issue of uh, connecting people um, in a short term. Um, I would like to start with the, the use case that we have done uh, in Tanzania. And it is an idea that actually started in 2018 and we were discussing in a room, um, uh, debating about, you know, we have about uh, 25,000 uh, schools in Tanzania, and probably less than 1% uh, percent of these schools are connected to the, to the internet. So as we discussed, we came up with uh, this uh, Tanzania uh, Digital Inclusion Program, and the idea is, uh, to connect people uh, plus, you know, connecting the schools. And uh, we were fortunate to get a grant to implement the project. And the model that we use is, uh, is called uh, Community Network uh, Innovation Hub, where we combine um, um, the issue of access or connectivity and innovation uptake in underserved areas and um, and uh, rural areas as well. So we started with one uh, community network innovation hub uh, called Kigamboni. And in this project, we were targeting um, uh, to connect, uh, you know, members who are willing to join our community network. And so far, we have managed to uh, organize about 150 community members. And what we have done in short term, uh, because, you know, Ponsolate, the issue of connectivity, you are talking about spectrum. So spectrum can be uh, a very daunting uh, issue when you are dealing with it, because it, there is a lot of money uh, involved and uh, a certain village uh, in Tanzania, even if the members were to unionize uh, maybe it will take uh, uh, almost a century to, to be able to pay uh, the license fee for, for that. So what we did, um, we, we came around, to put our efforts together, and um, um, we started by, um, I, 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 you know, um, uh, installing a fiber from the telecom operator to the termination where a, a community um, uh, center is. Um, it is it is a container. Uh, we put a, an infrastructure there, and each member, uh, you know, uh, would uh, contribute, so that you know the package that we get from the telecom operator, we slice it in terms of uh, the number of members that we have. So you find you are able to access broadband internet uh, at a very affordable price. Because, you know, it's like uh, if you are alone and you do the fiber installation, it's very expensive. But uh, with the number of people saying, uh, you know, the, you mobilize the number of people, uh, the minimum, our model that we've used requires a minimum of uh, 100 people. 
to be able to get a reasonable package uh, of connectivity from the fiber uh, from the uh, the telecom operator. So we have 100 people who are enjoying uh, uh, community, you know, uh, community broadband, uh, if I may call it. Uh, and uh, with that, we have been able to connect, uh, you know, around, uh, you know, we are going to 10 schools now. And a health center, uh, we have been able to do that. So to answer your question, uh, Ponsilet, I think if you can be able to mobilize on short term, as we wait, uh, I think uh, the Director General of ITU was talking about, you know, they are working on, you know, uh, in a way they can recognize the community network and also see a way they can be able to get uh, a spectrum for connectivity. So I think uh, on the short term, what we can do is actually engage uh, the community members, mobilize, see what the problem is, and then uh, once you do that, you are able to connect to the broadband internet. Um, actually, I'm one of those who are enjoying broadband internet. And sometimes when I go to the mobile uh, internet, I get crazy because you put a data bundle and within uh, a short period of time, uh, you are unable to, to stay there, you know, meaningfully. So uh, in the short term, I think we can engage because the community is there. Uh, the telecom operators, they have got the infrastructure. Uh, so the money that you put together, you can be able to get affordable uh, uh, broadband internet uh, through that uh, um, uh, arrangement. Uh, I'm very happy to see uh, the, the CEO of uh, Universal Communication Access Fund uh, is in the room, and uh, um, I think she will get a, an opportunity to, to talk about how they are also using uh, the basic internet equipment to connect uh, uh, as many schools as they can. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Nasha. I'll move over to Wisdom Donko, then I'll go to my online moderator. Um, Wisdom, um, Ghana is known to have the cheapest um, cost of internet um, in terms of data in Africa at 61 cents. That's the current statistics. Um, but we have a lot of situations whereby rural communities, despite the cost is down in, in, in Ghana, in terms of access for rural communities, broadband access is still very limited. Um, it will be great to get your perspective within the short term of achieving this access goal for all. Thank you very much, uh, Consulate. Um, yes, I'll be touching on a few areas uh, in my country. Um, my name is Wisdom Donko, uh, coordinator for Ghana IGF, and also um, ACA Tax Force, IGF Tax Force. Um, yes, um, I'll look at the um, first one, um, um, policy demands uh, of our rural communities. It looks like um, our government, uh, I, I should say, all of us, um, we, we don't understand the policy demands of our rural communities. So hence, uh, we kind of push everything to, to them. And then if it doesn't work, go back to the table. So I think we really have to look at this and see what are the actual needs of uh, our rural communities? Yes, the urban communities, uh, though we have part of the urban community that is poor, network is not there, but gradually they are getting there. But the rural communities is what we have to uh, think of now, see how we can bring them up to speed. Yes, there is, um, we need to understand their economic um, uh, situation. Uh, based on the sectors that we have in our countries. Uh, the first one is the agri sector. Mostly, if you go to the rural communities, they are mostly farmers. So, if these communities are mostly farmers, then uh, what we have to do for them uh, in order for them to also leverage on the uh, farming activities using the technology that we deploy for them. The first one would be that at the end of every season, 
they harvest their produce. Then these their produce go to waste. They don't end up in the market. So what can we do? And then what we can do is to look at those policies. The first one is what the community network that we are all talking about. And then we have if get in the community network, on top of it, we also have to think about the content. What content do they need to sell their produce? We need to look at that. And also the farmers themselves. They also need content. The first content is what let me say weather information. They need those weather information. Know when they have to uh, produce uh, uh, their crops. The other aspect is also um, health um, education, and then the most important thing is also entertainment. For this area, they don't have any form of entertainment. They go to farm, do all the farm works, and all that. They get to the house, and there's nothing to entertain them. Their only entertainment is what maybe uh, I should say, uh, husband and wife. The entertainment is in the bedroom, and when they are doing those entertainment, that means that we're producing more children. If they are producing more children, then that means uh, the poverty will keep going up. So we look need to look at all this and uh, begin to address them one after the other, not just thinking of giving them the community network and then one is they are sitting down. So I think um, whilst these are the, the directions that we are thinking, looking at the sectors, what are the sectors that apply to them? And we try to look at that and uh, deploy those solutions. Uh. Thank you very much, um, we, we, we wisdom. Thanks a lot. Um, there was a lot of giggling and laughing, but what you said, your last statement on this bedroom entertainment, especially in rural, um, most parts of rural parts of the world, um, it leads to, leads to a lot of population explosion, and if we get access there, there will be more things for them to do, and that's the reality, you know. Um, I'll move on over to my colleague, my online moderator from Bene IGF, um, Kosia Misu. If you have any um, questions um, online, we take them before I move um, to the diverse stakeholders um, we have here in this session on universal access within the short term. Kosi. Kosi, are you online? I thought I saw you earlier on. Is there any questions online, contributions? As we wait for, I would like to add, uh, uh, add one uh, important point. Uh, the, the engagement, uh, does not only limit itself to to the community members. It is very critical to engage our technocrats as well as the you know the member of parliament uh, because those are the the voices that can can put a legislation to. Um, so that can also uh, because if we frame uh, our 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 demand. Uh, on what we, is it that we want to achieve? Because you know, kids are not only in in in, in town centers or in, in cities; they are also in rural area. Um, just imagine what would have happened if uh, Bill Gates was born somewhere in some village remote. Do we have uh, uh, Microsoft Windows and all these mm -hmm. other technology? So I think we. We need to get into the senses of uh, of the technocrats so they understand the, the sides of the story. And this one hand, uh, you know, the fingers are not the same. So citizens are not the same, and we need uh, to, to accommodate all of them through policy, you know, uh, discrimination. Thank you, very, thank you very much, um, Nasa. Is Kosi, are you there? If you're not there, I will, I will just... Um, to a caveat um, to the various stakeholders that we have here. There's one thing that is very clear. Um, the telcos are the new oil in most parts of the world, you know. 
and that new oil is followed by data. So you can say that data is the new oil, but the telcos are the catalyst for those data. In in most parts of the global south, especially in Africa, you have um, all the telcos, most of their social responsibility programs are doing promotions for people to spend more on data um, but you you go back to see that most um, they are all profit making but at the end of the day we have a situation whereby the rural poor not only in the global south even even in um, western countries I, I'll, I'll just give you a story and I'll open the floor I was um, some years ago I was in in, in Wales in um, the outskirts of Wales in a, in, in a small town called West Hertfordshire. And I had to get connectivity in the night. I had to climb a little hill. And I couldn't believe that um, I was in the United Kingdom and I had to cr climb a little hill um, to, to get connection on my phone to be able to communicate, you know, but it's because it's a rural settlement of a population um, that was very minimal. And um, BT Telecom and all the other telecom providers, they didn't look at it as important to have more cell towers there. And that is the reality we face in many parts of the world. And if we are to achieve it in short, in the short term, I think it's necessary for all stakeholders to come together. And this is where I would like um, to throw the floor open to, to hear models that you think we can use to achieve um, universal access. Yes, sir, please introduce yourself and contribute. Thank you. Thanks a lot, and thanks for this example from Wales. It actually uh, fits very well into the discussion which I had with Josh Pereira, um, who is the head in in the EU for connecting the. Yeah. Introduce yourself, sir. Sorry, yes, Joseph Noll, professor at the University of Oslo and secretary general of the Basic Internet Foundation. Uh, the point which I want to make is, uh, in Europe, we have about twelve percent of uh, the population which is underserved, where there is no fiber, no whatsoever. And one of the models we discussed in in Europe is, yes, we are building fiber around the highways, and then we think about using five G technology to bringing the link from those fibers into the villages. And uh, exactly that model is a model which we also discussed here in Ethiopia with the Safaricom and uh, in Tanzania with Vodacom Foundation. And both operators are very interested in piloting with us or, or at least setting up the project. And the, the point I wanted to make on the business model what we have seen is the practical demands on the ground when we connected 50 schools in Kenya, when we connected uh, now 60 schools in Tanzania and scaling up to 300 schools, is that when we go together with the telecom operators, then they open up for new business models. Like in Kenya, we now get a 5 megabits per second SIM card for $58. And that, of course, is a real game changer as compared to the $500, which we otherwise see. It's currently only for the school connectivity. And we try to uh, <clears throat> extend that to, uh, to what we call the community learning living labs, a C3L, where we say we need to think about whether or not every community should have an empowerment center for those who can't go to school, who are left aside, or who are not trained on digital. I stop here. Too much info. Sorry. Yes, um, over to you from Togo NRI, um, Manuel Vinicius. Thank you. Thank you very much, Postlet. My name is Emmanuel Vitus from the Togo IGF. And um, I don't want to go back to what has been said so far. That uh, is a recommendation. We recently conducted a research with the Web Foundation regarding the Universal Service Fund. And my remark, my personal remark in most African countries, especially the Francophones, is that those funds are there. Meaning the telcos, some of them is 2%, some of them is 1% of their revenue being put in the coffers for uh, to connect in the last mile or those uh, universal, uh, how do you call it, access that we are actually uh, discussing here today. But the problem is corruption and how those funds are being managed. So my recommendation uh, was, in that report, my recommendation was that instead of giving those monies to the regulator or the government, it would be, it's very important to create independent entities where 
multi stakeholder have been represented in the use of those funds because we're talking about digital literacy we're talking about the last man we're talking about a lot of issues but the question is how those funds have been managed so it is very important that they should have you know a very well structured project that is being accepted by all the stakeholders to connect those rural communities to train them because uh, as somebody said giving them the internet is not enough we need to train them to, for it to be very meaningful for them because the younger ones especially in africa and most countries uh, in the world now are the younger people who are getting connected we have i don't want to mention the social media platforms but today when you go to those rural areas where they have access to internet, they only spend time on social media. So it is very important that we actually, you know, train them so that the uh, universal, uh, how do you call it, access fund doesn't just bring the internet to them, but also the digital literacy, including it into the curriculums or training. So it's very important. Yeah, thank you. I will call on my colleague from the Australian NRI online. Um, Australia, um, as you know, is very vast and um, with a lot of remote areas in terms of within the short term and access, what is being done. Please, you can please unmute her. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi. <laughs> thank you, Cheryl. Ranged and all from uh, Australian uh, National initiative which is uh, we call it this thing um and of course here we have a, a tyranny of distance uh, issue being one large continent with egg population and of course those dense populations and city spaces are very well served and have been uh, both before our uh, national broadband network rollout and uh, and of course starting off with our national broadband network you know, our remote and rural communities, a little bit like the uh, Welsh example, um, are still struggling and uh, very much needing to look at hybrid mechanisms. Uh, we don't have good 5G coverage. I'm very keen. I was listening very, very closely to uh, what I was just hearing um, because uh, at the moment the 5G coverage is overlapping in exactly the same way um, to the higher density population areas. So, um, it's, it's, it's a matter of recognising the universal uh, the universality, the requirement um, for uh, so many persons, uh, economic and education, as well as, of course, entertainment, um, for very good reasons, I hear, um, that we do need to make sure that networking is ubiquitous and it is cost effective. Our mobile connectivity is probably going to be um, the most likely in the remote and rural areas um, because, you know, in line to line is, is far too high um, a cost to put in other systems. But what we are finding, um, and this is feature in some areas, but I think it will probably make a difference, is with the, um, the low orbiting satellite uh, network as, as it is coming in. Um, our national broadband network does use satellite connectivity for remote and rural, but unfortunately, as it's become more popular, um, its ability to serve at that reliable and good speed, and it is not particularly affordable, I will mention, um, has diminished considerably. But we are finding some people, um, myself included, um, using now the LEO, the Low Earth Orbit Satellite System. Um, again, this is a cost point which is too high um, for many uh, communities, in particular disadvantaged communities. So we are working with our uh, government and our instrumentalities and, of course, our business um, interests to uh, try and drop the cost and increase the coverage. Um, but it is a huge challenge, but it's one we all have to meet to learn from. Um, so I'm very keen to learn from other countries. Um, it is a topic that our net thing, our internet governance community in Australia is particularly keen on um, because we have not vast areas to try and cover and the cost of it is usually insurmountable. I could go on, but I won't. Thank you.
Thank you very much, our colleague from Australia, NRI. I will also call on our colleague Judith from the um, NRI of the USA. Uh, uh, she's online, I suppose, um, to give a perspective from that. It's good to get a perspective from various regions of the world on this, because some people think maybe in the US or in the, uh, in the UK, everything is okay. So Judith, over to you. Uh, it's Judith House, and I wasn't planning on speaking, especially since uh, we have a USA representative there. But we have a lot of issues um, in the indigenous communities in the US and in the low income areas. Um, and we're also trying a bunch of community networks um, in urban areas to reach out to these low income areas. We're building, ISOC DC is building one in, in the Baltimore, re couple in the Baltimore region. And we're also trying to do some work with libraries um, in, in the region as well in building uh, sort of networks around them because the live uh, and in indigenous areas, um, the live most of these areas, there's been no access uh, to to uh, Internet in these areas. Um, so there is a. Uh, it's a big, it's a big effort to do that, um, and there is a recent legislation that has now, because of COVID, the Congress has real when a lot of kids couldn't go to school. There's a lot of movement to get funding for them, um, for the uh, subsidies for the internet access. Um, they used people used to claim, oh, they had one phone per household. Imagine trying everyone to use one phone when the parents are taking it off to uh, to work or something like that. So it's very difficult in some uh, live or low income areas for kids to uh, get homework done and others. So we have uh, in the US, we have a lot of issues also with uh, uh, internet access in the rural communities, in the urban communities. Um, one great example from uh, ISAC New York, started with ISAC New York, is the New York Mesh. This is an urban community network reaching out to the very low income areas um, and building all through volunteers, a large community network, um, but in the urban areas in um, Brooklyn and others to try to re provide access to, um, to low income communities. Uh, at, at low cost or free, um, and asking them to volunteer their services to, and they'll train them to help expand the network. So I think that will be my contribution. Thank you very much. I open the floor back now here um, for contributions on this topic, other NRIs, other individuals and organizations. Over to you, madam, and then behind. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Justina Mashiba. I'm the chief executive officer of the USF in Tanzania. I'm happy to be here, and uh, I was just listening to uh, different uh, contribution from different uh, uh, people. But uh, what I can do, what I can say from the, the the topic, what do we do to achieve universal connectivity in 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 a very short period? Um, the first one, I think, uh, that what we should do is engagement. When you're talking of engagement of stakeholders, that one is very key. Like if you want to maybe to go to the villages or rural, rural area to do maybe internet connectivity, you should really engage the community around that particular uh, place. So if you don't engage them at the end of the day, no one is going to use it. Um, another thing that we should also um, make use of it is uh, awareness. Once you go and roll out or do internet connectivity in areas and no one is aware about it, why do I have to take my 10 shilling by bundle or internet instead of going and buy a piece of uh, bread? So awareness is very important as well in uh, making sure that we connect everyone in uh, in Europe population. And the last one that I can really talk about is, is uh, on affordability part of it. We know the income of the uh, rural population is not the same as the, the, the one in, in, in urban population. So. Once we take all these three items together, wherever that we are going to invest in rural areas, we should really take into consideration of those uh, three three items, engagement, awareness, and affordability. 
we have done a lot in Tanzania. The guy from Togo was saying, I don't know, maybe you can come to Tanzania also to learn about it. We, we have done a lot. We have done a lot and we have a lot of African countries coming to benchmark in Tanzania. Like last week, we have a, a, a dedication from uh, uh, Uganda. We, we have a request from uh, Sierra Leone at the moment. So we have done a lot and maybe I can also invite you to come and see what we can do. And in our board of directors, we have private sector in our board of directors. So it is really like very transparent the way we disburse the, the, the subsidy, whatever, all the plan that we want to do in terms of rolling out uh, services, internet services in villages, we really, you know, engage and co agreed on how are we going to do that. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mike. Um, over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. My name is Osvaldo Laranquen from Dominican Republic. Uh, we have been working is uh, creating different, different schemes of universal access projects uh, since more than 10 years ago, uh, in trying to invite a different kind of stakeholders like ISPs and telecommunication sectors. Uh, many of those projects have failed because uh, there is no transfer of knowledge to the to the villages where the just have been made and that creates some kind of short-term uh, possibility and um, they are using not only public telephones to to transmit the wi-fi for that idea but also uh, trying to reach out with uh, network for the rural areas uh, recently uh, like yeah like 12 years ago the government implemented a, a rural community project it, it's like uh, small uh, places where they have different computers that has evolved time uh, to uh, digital innovation centers where people goes to to learn some digital literacy um, also to adopt different new technologies like robotics and like 3d printing and that they are very popular but they are not so much they are like 150 throughout the country which is uh, uh, which is good but could be better uh, because of the opportunity it had and recently the government has been working on a digital literacy project, uh, uh, reaching out to connecting the unconnected. And uh, there is a, a possible licitation uh, based on a, on a pilot uh, using a Starlink as a point of, of transmission and connecting with a different kind of network, uh, networks uh, distribution uh, throughout the, the population. So. There are different opportunities to see. Uh, Internet society is participating. We are uh, trying to, to be part of a licitation to try to, to bring solutions to rural community in a possible way, and also including a, a transfer of knowledge and to the creation of, of uh, some, some a body of maintenance uh, the communities to assure that they could be a turn proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Dominican Republic. I will take, I'll take um, three more interventions as um, we are going into the hour, and then I'll allow my panelists um, starting online um, um, to round up. So I'll start with Sheila um, online, but I'll take, and I want us to look at it from not just the access parts, but meaningful access, because there's one thing saying access in the in, in the Gambia I'll give you for example I mean we have 99 percent coverage in terms of um, um, mobile voice or on on data they will tell you they have 90 percent but it's not really meaningful access some places you're still on 2g and everything so I would like to hear some interventions on short term meaningful access not just access any contributions you're welcome to speak please Head prof. 
Thank you, Joseph Noll from the University of Oslo. The, the question of meaningful access is actually, is the current internet model working as it should work? Or should we look at the model of the road? Yes, we need someone building the roads, but once the roads are built, pedestrians and cyclists have free access on the road. If we translate that to the internet, we could ask ourselves, what are the digital pedestrians and what are the digital cyclists? Is that text and picture? Because we all know the money is in the broadband. The money is in the Bollywood, the Premier League, and these kind of services. And our internal calculations tell us that an internet light or the digital pedestrian cyclist, that's at as little as 1.5 to 2% of the total bandwidth used in a mobile network. Now that's still an additional text, so I could play that back to Justina or any of the government representatives for, is that the tax we, uh, we imply? But I, I'd love us to think about it. Thank you. Um, yes, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gayur. I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, we have uh, Internet Society of Afghanistan chapter. I'm the former president for Internet Society of Afghanistan chapter. It's a uh, farmer because we don't have any chapters anymore. So also I'm the IGF coordinator uh, for Afghanistan. Uh, we have been uh, organizing uh, IG, national IGFs in Afghanistan since 2016. And as well as uh, we have covered, uh, we have separately organized uh, youth IGF in Afghanistan in 2019. And we have uh, had a women's summit within our national IGFs uh, as a parallel session and as well as a uh, very important part of our national IGF was the, the Kids Academy, uh, IGF for Kids. So I will, uh, I, I do support the uh, MAMSET awareness, very important. Like in Afghanistan and some uh, areas, it's not just about the kids, not about the youth, even uh, elders. If you uh, uh, ask them about the internet, what it is, uh, they think it's uh, as a service, uh, just using the offices for official works, for official communications. And if you ask some the, the kids, they will just name a social media or they name a game which they have used through internet. So I think uh, beside the connectivity or meaningful access, uh, awareness is very much important that people should understand the value of internet, especially the time of uh, COVID, that uh, taught us a very good lesson that uh, how important connectivity is and uh, it is not just for communication for offshore communications but uh, connecting families uh, with each other thank you thank you i'm from afghanistan and i would like to um, throw a question to you because we all know right now what's going on especially with women education in terms of um, being a woman is one of the worst places, if not the worst place to live with as a woman. And access is needed. Most of them are not going to school or they have been stopped by the um, current um, Taliban regime there. How do you see women using in terms of access in Afghanistan and what are you doing about it for them to be able to, if they are not able to go to conventional schools, being able to get access to be able to learn online at home? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh... For those who, I mean, for those women who seek to learn online, uh, so they also understand the, the internet and they do access the internet, but the problem is the uh, financial crisis. They cannot, like most of the people cannot afford even pay for a, for internet connectivity. Like if you get a, a one gig data in your mobile phone, it costs you like almost three US dollars and uh, the unemployment rate is rising day by day. The poverty is rising. So the main issue, beside those other politician, politics side, financial crisis that most people, even if they have access, but they cannot afford to pay for it. So yeah, uh, we wanted to do for, for them something like as we did in the last 20 years. But right now, uh, I don't, I, I just humbly request do not um, in uh, broadcast what I'm saying uh, because I have to go back to Afghanistan uh, so uh, like uh, our hands are tight now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you can't imagine how difficult it was for me to get out of Afghanistan to come here 
because they don't know what's IGF. I was saying that I'm uh, invited uh, to participate in the IGF, and it is a UN recognized uh, event platform. They were asking me to show my badge, my UN badge. Like they think I'm an employee of the UN. So it's a difficult, very difficult to uh, convince them that I do work for my people, I do represent my people, I'm not representing any political party, not any group. So it was a nightmare. They even canceled my ticket, my uh, boarding pass, so, uh, and they didn't, uh, they wouldn't allow me to come here. But I finally uh, kind of begged to please let me go. It's, it's an important meeting for me. Uh, I, I go there for, for my people, for Afghanistan. So I finally got uh, their permission to come here. But uh, before I was a bit low profile, I they didn't know like who I am. I'm a bit exposed now, so I'm afraid of going back. I might be questioned. I don't know what. Thank you very much. Thank I mean, it's touching. The world is with you. The IGF community is with you. Um, I will just hand over to um, Anya from the IGF Secretariat, who runs the NRIs, um, to say some few remarks before um, we go into our panelists to close this session. Anya. Thank you very much, Ponsalat. Very kind of you. No, thank you for the hard work to all the NRIs who worked on this uh, very important topic throughout the year. Um, and I think just your your narratives that you're sharing here speaks about the complexity of the topic and of the fact that if we don't all work together across disciplines, across stakeholder groups, but especially across countries, which is a particular value of the NRIs, we will not bridge the digital divide because that's how complex and it is. And uh, with that, we will certainly, through the NRIs network, I'm sure, continue tackling this topic until we progress. Thank you, Anya. Sheila, Australia IGF online, please, last words. Then Judith. Oh, thank you, um, Cheryl again from Australia. I was literally just typing, um, but it seems to me um, we've heard very similar themes from many of us. So there's some globally applicable issues. Um, the degree of challenge might be different, but the actual topics are very much the same. And it comes down to that access also being um, affordable and effective. And so I think that working together, as well as learning from each other, uh, may be the only way forward, but it has to be in partnership with both the decision makers um, and those making the investment, and that, of course, is, is industry, um, and perhaps working as a bridge between government and industry to be an important function for many of us in the NRI. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Judith, last words. Uh, thanks again for allowing the USIGF to make comments. Uh, we don't, I echo everyone's view. Um, we need to work more with the communities um, and try to find innovative solutions to how to bring access to the low to the low income communities, indigenous groups, persons with disabilities, range of different groups. So we will uh, look towards. Uh, uh, community networks, other LEOs, other pro projects, um, working with local libraries to try to gain bring access to it. Um, so uh, I look forward to uh, future IGFs and hopefully we'll be on site the next one. Bye. Thank you, Judith from US IGF. I'm Roboto. Thank you, Bonsalet. Um, I think there are there is a, a lot of things to do. We can uh, improve the role of our governments. Um, we will continue listening to the demands from the private sector in our countries to the governments, asking for instance to lower the fees for spectrum. And I think there are uh, space for the local regulations, particularly in the case of my country. I I can be sure that the, there is a way for the government to actually make particular um, agreements with the private sector, with the telecommunications companies, mm -hmm. in order to uh, make this treatment different. And, uh, but of course, with a condition. Condition should be that they have to do this effort to lower prices, to implement infrastructure in, in, in places when, of course, those are not attractive for this sector, but 
uh, the need for communications is, is, is really critical. So uh, I think there is too much to improve and hopefully during the following. Thank you, Roboto from Bolivia, IGF, Mohammed, Bangladesh. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I particularly, uh, uh, especially uh, focused in the meaningful access. Our country is uh, connectivity is uh, everything okay, but uh, problem is meaningful access. Uh, when we are uh, going to rural area, uh, in mobile connectivity have, but data connectivity don't have. Mobile connectivity show 2G, but my mobile operators say uh, we are providing 4G. Same problem also in the city also. Uh, we are around the city, one corner to another corner. Uh, one corner, so VIP area, uh, uh, like Dhaka is the city, capital city, the Gulshan is the VIP area. Mention is the 4G. When I'm going to uh, uh, old city, Dhaka place, they are showing the 2G, uh, maybe connectivity. This is the meaningful connectivity is very important in our country right now. Thank you. Ahmed from Bangladesh, I like that word, meaningful connectivity. NASA. Thank you. Uh, I've got uh, the appeal. Uh, there is, if I, I were to borrow from Martin Luther King, um, he said, uh, be not afraid, we shall overcome. And the, the issues that we are having, the challenges for connectivity, um, uh, first of all, these, these ch challenges, um, there is no challenge in this worldwide in which the human ingenuity not rise above it so i believe uh, let us uh, you know uh, roll up our sleeves in in this in this room and see ways we can be able to connect our communities where we are the guy said do what you have with uh, what you do what you can with what you have where you are so i believe uh, as we live in this room uh, we can be able to uh, start, you know, organizing. We can start engaging our policymakers, and in the end, we can give the next generation of Africa, the digital young men and women of Africa, a story that they can be able to participate effectively uh, uh, on the digital economy through meaningful and affordable internet access. I end there. I think until next time. Thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you, Nasser. Wisdom, last words? Hi, Jeff. Yes, uh, my, my last word is uh, uh, have to look at uh, local ownership. The ownership of things that we are talking about. We see that government provide uh, some of these solutions to rural communities but then those communities are not directly and when they finish and then they leave the project becomes quite elevated so it has to be a way that community have to open that uh, facility to their leaders and that way and sustain uh, a project that, uh, very much before I um, close this session with my last words, um, the repertoire here, please, um, other repertoires, please coordinate with him. We have our repertoire here um, for this session. I want to thank you all, especially our online um, audience, um, both who spoke. Um, it was good. We had two women, Sheila from Australia, IJF, and Judith for um, the US IGF speak because I was a little bit um, very uncomfortable that all the speakers. <laughs> Um, in person were all male speakers, you know, so I'm, I'm very happy we had the views from those and we had views from other, um, from different continents of the world. It's important we keep the conversation going within our various NRI communities and above all we collaborate. That's the only way we can achieve meaningful access and I'm Pon Slate from the Gambian IGF um, and also chair of the African Tax Force for, for the UNECA closing this session. God bless you and have a nice day.